Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about industry analysis and specifically looking at the five forces. The five forces model was developed by this dude, uh, Professor Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, uh, also evil genius, and I'll talk about why I think he's an evil genius. And uh, he wrote this book in 1980 called Competitive Strategy, and it basically reshaped uh, not just the, the research of strategy, but the entire discipline of management. And uh, it really was a, a pivotal um, idea in the history of the, the academic approach of management, and uh, it's reshaped management philosophy ever since then. Um, if you're gonna read one book uh, in the management oeuvre, then I would highly encourage it to be a uh, competitive strategy. It is an enlightening book, although incredibly dry and boring. The five forces model essentially says that there are five forces that determine how the value in an industry, which I represent here, that circle is all the value that exists within an industry, the return on investment that exists within an industry. How is that split up amongst um, the different players in the industry? And according to Porter, there are five forces that influence this. The first is the power of sellers. Uh, and when we talk about sellers, what we mean by that is businesses, companies, firms, competitors, the people that are trying to devise strategy. Uh, if you own a business, you'd be the seller. Um, that's what we mean by sellers. The next force that influences how this value is split up is the bargaining power of buyers. Buyers are customers, consumers. When you go to the grocery store, you are a buyer. When you buy a car, you are a buyer. Uh, next, we have the bargaining power of suppliers. Uh, and suppliers are the people that provide resources, technology, labor. Uh, and then we have the threat of new entrants. And new entrants are entrepreneurs, innovators, startups, anyone that's not currently in the industry but could be. Uh, and then also the, the threat of substitutes. And substitutes are alternative products and services. They don't do the exact same thing as the product or service in the industry, uh, but they do something kind of similar. And so customers have the, buyers have the option of, of going to substitutes. Now, uh, Michael Porter was getting a dual degree in both economics and management at Harvard, and his colleagues in the economics department were doing research on how do you design government policy in such a way to maximize competition within an industry. Uh, because when, when, we, when people talk about capitalism and all the benefits of capitalism, it's all about competition, right? It's competition that provides um, efficiency, productivity, innovation. So if we want to create the most value for our society, if we want to create the most value you, especially for buyers, which is you and me, um, then we need to create the perfectly competitive industry. And economists were talking about how do we design industries so they're super, super competitive. And what they came to was this conclusion that a perfectly competitive industry looks like this. We have buyers, sellers, and suppliers all getting a, a pretty equal share of the pie. There's a lot of sellers in the industry and they're not very powerful. So they're all jock or they're all about the same power. They're all jockeying for position. They're all fighting each other. Uh, suppliers are more concentrated and more powerful than sellers. And then buyers are the most concentrated and the most powerful. And so buyers are, because they're concentrated, because they're powerful, they're able to play sellers off against each other and make sure they're getting the value uh, that they deserve. The other thing about the industry is that it has these permeable borders. So it's really easy for new entrants to come in and um, challenge existing sellers. So if existing sellers in the market, are, their prices are too high, they're not delivering the quality or the functionality that buyers want, then it's really easy uh, for entrepreneurs to step in and start competing with them. On the other side, you'll also notice it's really easy for buyers to leave the industry and go to substitutes. Uh, and then finally, it's really easy for suppliers to sell directly to buyers, something we call forward integration. So if sellers ever get a little bit too greedy, a little bit lazy, we have these powerful suppliers that can step into the industry and start selling directly to buyers. And, and in that way, they act on as a check on the power of sellers. And so this is what 
a perfect industry looks like to economists where you have a lot of sellers competing against each other you have powerful suppliers that act as a credible threat against those sellers if they start to take too much of the value for themselves you have a credible threat of new entrants to come in and challenge existing uh, businesses existing sellers it's the buyers are concentrated and relatively powerful and if they ever don't like what's going on in the industry they've got a lot of other substitutes that they can go to and it's really easy to do that now why I call Michael Porter evil genius Michael Porter is because he took research that was designed specifically for the public good to try and to, to be used to try and create the most value for society um, to empower buyers and suppliers and, and uh, against sellers and keep everything a fair playing field. And he took that research and he turned it on its head and he said, ah, businesses can use this to design strategy in order to structure industries in a way so that sellers get the most power. Uh, and so this is what Michael Porter sees as the perfect industry. Uh, we still have buyers, suppliers, and sellers. Sellers are getting a much bigger chunk of the return on investment in an industry. How are they doing this? Well, first of all, there's only a few sellers and they're very powerful and they're uh, not equally powerful. You have one clear leader in the industry and then maybe a couple other hanger ons, um, but it's a concentrated seller industry with a clear power dynamic. Suppliers, on the other hand, are are weak and they're less concentrated than the sellers. So there's more suppliers than there are sellers. And the same thing with buyers. There's a lot of very weak buyers, so sellers can play them off each other. Uh, as you can see, there's very high borders around this industry, so it's really hard for new entrants to come in and challenge existing sellers. Uh, and it's really difficult for buyers to get out of the industry and use substitutes. Uh, and then finally, it's really hard for suppliers to forward integrate and sell directly to buyers. Uh, and so for sellers, this is what the perfect industry looks like. And this is essentially Michael Porter's plan or model. He took the, the public policy research that economists were doing on how to make the most competitive industry and pivoted to how businesses can use that information to make an industry, to structure an industry that is most effective for them. One thing uh, I want you to be really aware of is that we're talking about an industry level analysis. So um, the industry, all the, all the sellers are in the same industry, right? This isn't uh, an analysis that is unique to each business. It's an analysis which is unique to the industry as a whole. We're going to talk about each of these five forces in detail. We're going to start with substitutes. Uh, we've talked a lot about substitutes uh, last time in our last class, so I think it makes sense to start there. Substitute is any product that performs the functional, emotional, or social task of the original product or service. And uh, substitutes pose a threat to industry return on investment. Uh, so an example of a substitute is I put gasoline in my car uh, you know, every week so that I can drive to school and drive home and, and groceries and everything else. Um, I could, if I wanted, start putting electricity in my car uh, and that would be a substitute. So I'm using gasoline to power my car. I could use electricity to power my car. So these are our substitutes of one another. Substitutes are by definition less efficient or effective than the original product. So if I wanted to start using electricity for my car, you know, you uh, it wouldn't have as much of a range. It takes a lot longer to charge an electric car as opposed to just filling up a tank of gas. It's not always easy to find a charging station. So I could start using electricity to power my car, but it would be more inconvenient than using gasoline. So buyers will switch when the cost of the substitute combined with the loss of efficiency and effectiveness is less than the cost of the original product, um, which is a way of saying that gasoline costs me about $16, or sorry, excuse me, 16 cents a mile to power my car. Uh, and it would cost about four cents a mile to power my car with electricity. Um, and so it's about a quarter of the price to power my car with electricity. Um, that's still, uh, not enough savings to justify the inconvenience for me. So uh, as soon as, you know, if gas were to double in price and suddenly I'm paying 32 cents a mile and uh, 
electricity is still only four cents a mile, maybe that would justify switching um, and all those kind of inefficiencies that I was talking about. But the main reason, I mean, I would definitely start putting electricity in my car tomorrow if I could, but the reason I don't, the reason I can't, is that my car does not take electricity, right? I can't just plug my Honda CRV in uh, and drive it to school. And so in order to start using electricity to get to school, I would have to buy an electric car. And that's what we call a switching cost. I have this technology that burns gasoline. If I want uh, to start using electricity, I'm gonna have to put a really big upfront investment in buying an electric car. And that's what we call a switching cost. I'm gonna have to switch from the old industry, gasoline, to the new industry, electricity. High switching costs prevent buyers from using substitutes. John Oliver did a really good uh, takedown on mobile home parks. And one thing mobile home parks uh, one reason that mobile home parks can be so profitable is that once people buy a, a mobile home, they own the mobile home, but they're only renting the plot, uh, plot of land, but it's really hard to move mobile homes. A lot of times they're not actually really designed for it. They kind of fall apart. Um, and so once you put your mobile home on a space in a mobile home park, the landlord has a lot of control, a lot of power. They can jack up your rent, jack up your rent. And what are you gonna do? You own this house, you have to put it somewhere. Um, it's stuck there. So they can't switch to a different mobile home park. Uh, it's difficult to sell uh, old mobile homes. People would rather just buy new ones and put them on their own plot. Uh, and so it's hard to get rid of the mobile home if you wanna to move to an apartment, a condo, a house, whatever. Um, and so once people buy a mobile home and put it in a mobile home park, they're, they're kind of locked in there. Um, and that, that prevents them from using substitutes. Uh, switching costs can arise from having to buy new equipment. So this is actually some uh, industries, this is their whole model, right? Uh, with razor blades for shaving, um, they sell the handle really cheap or they give it to you for free and then they make all their money uh, selling you razor blades. And if you want, if their ra razor blades ever get too expensive or whatever, then you'd have to go out and buy a new shaving handle. Incre that, that would be a low switching cost. Uh, I have uh, an electric toothbrush and I got my electric toothbrush for a steal. I think I got it for like 15 or 20 bucks and I was like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, and then I figured out the heads cost like 10 bucks each as well, right? So I'm spending like 40 or $50 a year on, uh, on toothbrush heads now. Uh, and if I wanted to switch to a different, um, if I wanted to, to start using uh, a different electric toothbrush, then I would have to buy a whole new handle. That's a switching cost. Uh, video game consoles do this as well, that uh, they sell you the console up front and they can, they can often sell it at a loss even, and then you only buy video games that work with that console. Switching costs can also arise from having to learn new technology. This is a guilty confession of mine, but all of my amazing, amazing graphics that you see in my PowerPoints, I do all of my um, uh, graphic uh, editing in Microsoft Paint. And uh, the reason I do that is because I know how to use Paint. I've been using it for decades, literally. Uh, and so it's really easy and intuitive for me to get what I want from it. Now there's a lot that Paint can't do. I could start using like Photoshop, but man, photo I've opened up Photoshop and it is very confusing to me. And I would have to like sit down and learn how to use Photoshop. Um, and so that's a switching cost. Uh, switching costs can arise from convenience. So Apple is really good at integrating all of their products together so that, you know, you've got your Apple Watch and it syncs perfectly with your iPhone, which syncs perfectly with your MacBook and all these things work together so well. If you want to go out and get a droid, then oh, your Apple Watch isn't going to work as well and it's not going to interact as effectively with your uh, MacBook, right? Uh, I used to have a time machine, which is a or time capsule, which is a super convenient device where it automatically backs up your computer, uh, your MacBook over Wi-Fi, and it's just like super convenient. You don't even have to think about it. The only problem is it doesn't back up your information. It backs up the entire system. So when my MacBook finally crashed and I wanted to access the information, I had to use another MacBook. I couldn't go out and buy a PC laptop to access that information uh, because it wouldn't work, right? And so basically with the time capsule, they're setting you up to buy another MacBook. If your MacBook crashes, hey, you've got it all backed up. 
Uh, but to access that data, you're going to need another MacBook. So I actually had to borrow a MacBook and download all the information and switch it to my PC, uh, which was a huge pain. And that's on purpose. Uh, another example of switching costs is potential loss of information. So one of the reasons uh, that I was so hesitant to quit uh, social media for so long is that I had a lot of my pictures on social media and that was the only place I had them. And I was worried that if I quit uh, Facebook, I, I'd lose all my albums and all my pictures. Um, and you can request all your pictures from Facebook, uh, but they don't make it easy, right? You have to like, I can't remember what you have to do, but you have to send in like a formal request. It's not like you can just download them directly from the site, which obviously is technologically possible, right? They purposely make it difficult to get all of your data off of Facebook uh, so that you're less likely to quit. Okay, so that's threat of substitutes. And uh, in order to discourage substitutes, we want buyers to have really high switching costs. So it's expensive for them uh, to switch from one industry to another, just like I'd have to go out and buy a Tesla to switch from uh, gasoline power to electric power. That's an expensive switching cost. The next thing we're gonna talk about is new entrants. <clears throat> New entrants or new competitors will enter an industry when the uh, return on investment exceeds the cost of entry barriers. And uh, entry barriers are anything that prevents a um, competitor, a new competitor from coming into the industry. So this can be things like the cost of technology. If you have to build like say a factory, uh, that's gonna be really expensive. Economies of scale where existing competitors are making so much of something that they can make it much cheaper than you brand awareness and customer loyalty. All these things prevent new competitors from coming in. We're gonna focus specifically on two entry barriers, government regulation and access to distribution channels. Government regulation is one of the most powerful or can be one of the most powerful influences on entry barriers. Uh, so for example, uh, people complain about uh, building new developments in San Francisco. San Francisco is in desperate need of housing and yet to build new developments is this lengthy process where you have to go through all this government review, go through all these permits, pay all this money. Uh, and so it's very difficult. Those all represent uh, entry barriers to come in and, and offer new housing in San Francisco. Uh, a liquor license in San Francisco costs 250K. So uh, if you wanna open up a bar and start competing with the existing bars in San Francisco, you're gonna need 250 grand just to get the liquor license. Uh, if you wanna be a degree offering uh, institution, then you need to go through all these hoops and get accredited so that the government will recognize your degree and pay for uh, and, and be willing to give you things like federal aid, which most, uh, um, universities, public and private, depend on. Uh, some industries have very low entry barriers. So uh, if I wanna be an executive coach, I can just call myself an executive coach and then start charging people for it. There's no, I don't need to do any certification. I don't need to do anything. I can just be an executive coach, uh, which, you know, by the way, if you're looking for anyone that's, if you know anyone that's looking for an executive coach, uh, I'm, I'm very good executive coach. Uh, what else we got? Oh, if I want to make an app, I can just do that in my bedroom, on my computer. I don't need to ask anyone, get permission, get permits, sign regulations, anything like that. Uh, if you want to sell crafts on Etsy, you can go ahead and do that and you don't need government approval. Uh, and so there are some industries where it's very difficult to get into the industry because of government regulation. And then there are some industries where uh, it's very easy to get in. And uh, in order to have a competitive industry, we, we want it to be easy for new people to come into the industry. Uh, an example of using government regulation to um, prevent new entrants into an industry is patent trolling. So we have government regulation about intellectual property and patents and who owns what and who can use it. Um, and so existing competitors can sue new entrants for infringing upon their patents. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't even matter if the person is actually infringing upon the patent or not, because it's really expensive to defend yourself against this. And so the idea isn't that, hey, this person's actually uh, using our patent and taking advantage of our technology. It's that, well, either way we can sue them for it. Uh, they're not gonna be able to defend themselves and then we'll win. 
Um, an example of this is Apple submitted a patent for rounded corners. They said that they had invented rounded corners. Um, obviously, they know that one of the things they offer is, is innovative technology, and so they're using government regulation to try to keep out new competitors. Uh, restrictive regulation can often serve incumbents. So we saw this in the taxi industry before Uber and Lyft, that there was just incredibly uh, high regulation on uh, taxi services, limo services. Um, it was incredibly highly regulated. Um, and the purpose of that was there were only a few taxis around and, and the taxi companies wanted to be very powerful, wanted to lock down that industry and wanted to prevent competition. Um, and they were very, very effective at that. And that's one of the reasons that the service for taxis was so bad before Uber and Lyft, uh, um, and then also why they were so expensive. Another threat to, uh, or another uh, entry barrier is access to distribution channels. Um, Amazon is a really good example of this. If I want to sell basically any product, then uh, I'm gonna have to sell it on Amazon, right? Um, and Amazon has a lot of control over that distribution channel. And um, one thing they do is they pay attention to data on what are the most uh, profitable products that they sell. And then they start making their own versions of them and they start putting them at the very front of the page. So like, for example, when I search for an Oxford shirt, uh, Amazon has their own uh, brand of, of clothing lines called Good Threads. And when I search Oxford sh uh, shirts, this is one of the first things that pops up. It's near the top of the page. Um, it's pushing their own product. And so if I'm trying to sell Oxfords, um, I'm competing with Amazon, who is not only selling Oxfords, but they own the store that sells Oxfords too. And they're obviously going to be pushing their own products. Net neutrality concerns the rules of the biggest distribution channel, which is the internet. Um, so if you're not familiar with net neutrality, net neutrality essentially says this, that uh, say there's some like different websites you go to. Say you stream media at Netflix, uh, on YouTube, and then also on Hulu. Um, and currently right now, it doesn't matter which website I use, I'm paying the same rate, right? That if I uh, stream a gig of data from Netflix is going to cost me the same as if I stream a gig of information from Hulu. Uh, now, let's just say hypothetically that uh, my internet service provider, Comcast, has a relationship with one of these organizations. Say they own a stake in Hulu. What they can do uh, is increase the price of data from Netflix and YouTube so that I actually have to pay more when I'm streaming from Netflix or YouTube than I do when I'm paying from Hulu. And by controlling that uh, distribution channel, they can push customers away from competitors and to themselves. Uh, regulatory capture can influence access to distribution channels. So regulatory capture is when um, the industry controls the government regulation of that industry. And I think uh, the internet is a really good example of this. So this is Ajit Pai. Uh, he's the current head of the FCC. This is an actual picture of him. So if you don't hate him for the net neutrality thing, then you can at least hate him for this. Uh, he is a former, he was former assistant general counsel for Verizon one of the largest internet service providers, uh, and he overturned net neutrality. He said that, uh, no, that uh, if organizations want, if companies want, they can have differential pricing uh, for websites. So we see this influence where government regulation can actually be used as a tool uh, to prevent entrepreneurship, to prevent uh, innovation from coming in um, when it is captured by the existing competitors within that industry. We've talked about substitutes. We've talked about threat of new entrants. The next thing we're going to talk about is the power of buyers. Hey, that's me. Yeah, that's that's usually you. If you are a middle class person, you probably spend uh, the majority of your income buying things. And so when we talk about buyers, um, we're often talking about normal everyday uh, people. 
So in Porter's mind, buyers were these evil people competing with the industry by forcing down prices, were bargaining for higher quality or more services, were playing competitors against each other, all at the expense of industry profitability. This is a direct uh, Porter quote. And so Porter sees very clearly, sees buyers as the enemy in an industry. And he sees that one thing that businesses should do to in, to maximize their return on investment is to disempower buyers, is to take away uh, buyers' bargaining power. And uh, there's some different ways you can do that. So what does a powerful buyer look like? You are a powerful buyer of bread. No one is screwing you on bread. Uh, you have, you're, you're pretty smart about bread. You've been buying bread most of your life, so you probably know how much a loaf of bread should cost. If someone tries to sell you a $20 loaf of bread, you're gonna call BS on that, right? You have a ton of different bread options to choose from, too many probably. Uh, and not only that, but there's a lot of bread substitutes, right? If bread ever gets too expensive, let's have some tortillas. Let's have some pita or even even rice could be a bread substitute so you're very powerful no one's going to screw you over on bread on the other hand you are a weak internet buyer right there's not a lot of places to buy internet from maybe only one or two companies that provide access to your location um you don't really understand the cost maybe you do i don't really understand the costs associated with uh uh providing internet so i'm paying like a hundred dollars for internet every month i don't know how much it's actually costing comcast to to deliver me internet um and not only that there's there's no substitutes right if you don't use the internet what are you gonna do telegraph uh ham radio ugh, public library gross no so uh you really have no uh substitutes for internet you don't know how much it costs and uh, there's not a lot of options to get it from so you're a weak internet buyer and this is of course what michael porter wants when you look at the internet service provider industry um michael porter that's exactly what michael porter wants uh, buyers are powerful when they make up a large portion of seller's revenue. This is Ojai Valley, this is where I went to high school. And uh, they grow a lot of oranges out there. And uh, there's a lot of farmers that grow oranges out there. And there's really only a few companies in the United States that buy bulk oranges, um, like Sunkist, for example. And so those companies that buy uh the vast majority of oranges in the united states they have a lot of power right um, because if you don't sell to them uh who else are you going to sell to um, and not only that but you have a perishable food item as well. you have a perishable item as well and so buyers are really powerful in this case uh, the other reason uh, that buyers are really powerful in like the citrus industry is because the products are essentially undifferentiated. It's not, there's not a big difference in quality of oranges from one farmer's orchard to another farmer's orchard. orchard. Um, and so uh, there's, there's a few buyers out there that are buying the bulk of the product and the product is basically the same. So if you don't sell it to them, they'll just go get it somewhere else. Uh, and this is true for citrus. This is true across the agricultural industry. Uh, buyers are powerful when they have full knowledge about the costs associated with a product or service. This is why, I, I don't know about you, but I am not very powerful when I go into the mechanic, right? Like I take my car into the mechanic and he's like, oh, you need a new doohickey woo dad. And that will be, you know, the part is only 14 cents, but the labor is going to be $15,000. And I'm just like, okay, that sounds right. I don't know. Uh, because I don't know that much about cars. Uh, and so because of that lack of knowledge, um, I, I don't have a lot of bargaining power with, with uh, the seller. Uh, companies or industries specifically try to obscure prices to make uh, it more difficult for buyers to know what's going on. So like, you know, you need a, a PhD in accounting to understand your Comcast bill every month. Um, look at this. I mean, this is like a whole page with like, 50 different numbers uh, and of course that's done on purpose they're trying to obscure how much you're paying and what you're paying for the most egregious example of this is the healthcare industry where you have no idea what anything costs uh, like when your doctor tells you you need an operation you're never like well how much is that gonna run me uh, you know I, I mean maybe ballpark but they don't even know most of the time right and then you get back from uh, from the hospital and you have a bill for like uh, $40 for two aspirins um, because they purposely obscure the prices of everything you never quite know what you're paying for things and so it allows them it takes away power from the buyers and it allows them to charge exorbitant prices for things
All right, so far we've discussed substitutes, we've discussed the threat of new entrants, we've discussed buyer power. The next thing we're going to talk about is supplier's power, supplier's bargaining power. Uh, so suppliers are anything that provides raw materials, labor, technology, support services, anything like that. And powerful suppliers can act as a check on sellers. The main reason for this is, as you can see from the, the arrows going from the pink to the gray, is that when suppliers are powerful, um, they act as a check on the, the they act as a check on the power of sellers because they, they always have the threat of selling directly to buyers. And so sellers got to be uh, providing value or else suppliers will step in and do it themselves. Uh, so suppliers are powerful. We call this uh, forward integration, the idea that I can start directly making the product and selling it to consumers. Um, travel agencies are a good example of this, right? So for a long time, if you wanted to, to go somewhere, it was much more convenient to go to a travel agent and they'd get you the tickets and reserve the hotel rooms and all this other stuff, right? Uh, and then when you have the invention of the internet, you no longer needed travel agents. That uh, if I'm gonna buy a plane ticket, I don't need to go through the travel agent, I can go directly to the airline. Same thing with hotels or, or anything that I wanna do in a foreign country, right? Uh, or for travel. Um, and so it basically eliminated that industry. And this is the story of the internet, right? This, the internet allowed suppliers to go directly to consumers, directly to buyers, instead of going through a, a middle person. Okay, so uh, labor is also a supplier. And I'm gonna give you a minute to read this. Oh wait, you can pause it if you wanna read it. So uh, this is a quote from Porter, uh, where he's specifically talking about the power of of uh, labor as a supplier and saying that, hey, labor is a, a really powerful check against sellers. And especially when employees unionize in an industry, then they can be really powerful. And uh, let's see, he says here that uh, tightly unionized labor can bargain away a significant fraction of potential profits in an industry. What he means by that, and I just want to be really clear, what he means by that is that uh, when employers are or, when employees are organized, they can demand things like higher wages, better benefits, and that that's bad. That's a bad thing for the industry, industry uh, profitability going to the seller. And so if you're a person that works for a living, this is you, right? Like Porter is explicitly laying out strategies um, to disempower you. And he's saying that the what good companies do, what good industries do, what smart companies and industries do is disempower their labor. Um, and if you, like I said, if you work for a living, unless you are living off capital gains, then this includes you. So this is how Porter wants industry structured, right? And one of the main things is that we have uh, lots of suppliers that are not very powerful and are competing against each other. And that's exactly what the labor market is, right? labor market is like, right? Where um, you have fewer organizations hiring people than people getting hired. Um, and so those organizations have more power than the people that they are hiring. Uh, and it's because there's, there's uh, lots of potential suppliers. I'm a supplier of labor, you're a supplier of labor, and we're competing against each other for fewer jobs or for fewer organizations. Uh, and so this is great for the sellers. Now, what suppliers can do, what labor suppliers can do, is band together to make themselves more concentrated. Uh, and we call that unions, which are not actually bad, guys. I don't know what you've heard on, on the TV, but unions are actually a very effective way for workers in an industry, labor suppliers, to band together and um, concentrate themselves and give themselves more bargaining power against the sellers. Uh, so by increasing the labor supplies bargaining power, unions can capture more of an industry's value for its workers. And when unions were strong in the United States, they were very effective at doing this. So unions were key uh, at things like instituting a minimum wage, instituting maximum hours and overtime pay, uh, instituting things like workers' compensation and social security. These are all things that 
uh, sellers that organizations have to pay into that take away uh, their slice of the value of the industry and instead give it to uh, the labor supply, which in this case is employees and workers. And of course, Porter finds this a bad thing, right? That that's labor doesn't deserve the profit, that the goal is to get as much of the return on investment to the seller, to the businesses as possible. And so uh, businesses consciously try to undermine organized labor and labor power. And they do it in a lot of uh, very nefarious ways. One thing is offshoring. Um, and you hear, like when Donald Trump was running for president, you hear, and, and other po politicians do this all the time, right? We don't make things in America anymore. Like we used to be a manufacturing country um, and manufacturing jobs were good and you could live a good middle-class lifestyle on manufacturing jobs. That's true, but there's nothing like magical about manufacturing jobs. It's just that manufacturing jobs were highly unionized. And so uh, workers in manufacturing industries were able to use that unionization as bargaining power to get these middle-class um, jobs, jobs that could give them middle-class uh, lifestyle. Um, and so the organization saw this and their response to this was to consciously uh, offshore industries with high unionization to break the backs of unions. And it was incredibly effective, right? Um, that that uh, unions are much less powerful than, uh, in the United States than they were 40 or 50 years ago. Um, that pay in manufacturing industries is incredibly low. Um, and a big part of that is because you're now competing with Chinese workers and um, Vietnamese workers and Bangladeshi workers, right? So they purposefully offshore jobs to break the backs of unions in the United States. And it was very effective. Uh, another thing that organizations do to undermine the power of labor is to use temporary and contract workers. Um, like for example, uh, Amazon uses a lot of contract workers in their warehouses. And when you constantly have people coming in and out, it's really hard to unionize. It's really hard to collectively bargain for more of that slice of the value from the industry. And then also when you're a contract worker or a temp worker, you just don't have a lot of job security, right? So it's really easy to fire you if you speak up. Businesses use undocumented workers to avoid unionization. Um, undocumented workers are often in kind of precarious life situations, right? They're always at risk of being deported. Um, and so they're, they're not likely to, to get together, to band together and speak up against their employers. And then finally, businesses use government regulation to make labor organization difficult or impossible. So there's actually a lot of laws that make it really difficult to organize labor and to unionize. Um, one of them is this Supreme Court ruling called Janus. And uh, it's this guy, Mark Janus, who uh, was a public school teacher. And he's like, hey, I don't want to be in the union. I shouldn't have to pay union fees if I don't want to be in the union. Um, and everyone's like, yeah, I mean, that at first blush, that sounds really intelligent, right? You shouldn't have to be in a union. You shouldn't, having a job shouldn't be dependent upon being in the union or not. What that actually looks like though, my girlfriend is a second grade teacher in the Oakland Unified School District, uh, and they went on strike in February. And so uh, she's part of the union and union fees cost about $1,000 a year. Uh, and so she's paying that $1,000 a year. Uh, she was off of work for a week for striking. So she missed that uh, week of pay for that. Um, and it was, for her, it was, you know, it was a very costly thing. Now, one of her coworkers is like, nah, I don't want to be a part of the union. And so she's like, $1,000 a year is too much. So she doesn't pay her union fees. She didn't strike. So she got paid that week uh, that my girlfriend did strike and lost her pay for that. Um, and yet that person who's not a part of the union gets all of the same benefits as my girlfriend who is in the union. So the, the strike was ultimately successful. Um, a lot of the things they won were better conditions for students, so like smaller class sizes, more support services on campuses. Uh, my girlfriend's non-union coworker gets to benefit from all of those things. They got a raise in pay, which 
the non-union worker gets to benefit from. And uh, they also got a strike bonus, um, where w which was basically supposed to make up for the, the money they lost while they were striking. And again, the non-union worker that didn't strike got that bonus as well. So she actually ended up with more money than the union workers who had strike, who struck, uh, and who forced the school district for these benefits. And so you have, uh, so while, yeah, it kind of at first blush, it sounds like you shouldn't have to be a part of a union if you wanna work somewhere. The consequence of that is that you have people who are not contributing to a system that is advocating for them and that is creating benefits for them. Uh, and so this is just one example. Uh, Janus applies to all uh, public workers, federal workers, or uh, public workers, sorry. Uh, there are other uh, laws like right to work laws. And again, right to work, that sounds so good. But what those laws really do is make it really difficult or nearly impossible to organize people because why am I gonna stick my neck out and strike? Why am I gonna lose money uh, striking when it doesn't matter i'm gonna get if you guys win i get the benefits either way and if you lose then hey i'm glad i didn't stick my neck out uh and so regulation like this really undermines uh the ability of labor to unionize in the united states all right so so far uh we're talking about the five forces that influence uh how the roi in an industry is split up uh, so far, we've talked about substitutes, we've talked about the threat of new entrants, we've talked about uh, buyer power and supplier power. The last thing we'll talk about is intensity of competition between sellers. So this point. Uh, so again, when, when you hear people talk about capitalism, they're like, oh, competition's great. And, and you hear business leaders talk about, oh, we want competitive free markets, like let competition decide. Uh, and yet intensity of competition in an industry undermines return on investment in that industry. And uh, what Porter lays out is like, actually, we don't, if, if you're a seller, you don't really want a competitive industry. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is a, again, a Porter quote. I'll give you a second to read it. And I just want you to pay special attention to that very last line. Thus, firms are mutually dependent. That businesses in an industry are not actually competing with each other. They are dependent upon one, in a, one another to maximize the share of value that goes to them as a collective whole. And this is, this is, a, border, this is a Porter quote. Uh, so some forms of competition are highly unstable and quite likely leave the entire industry worse off from the standpoint of profitability. So competition, eh, actually not that good. Uh, if there are a few firms of equal size and power, it creates instability because they're prone to fight each other and have the resources for sustained and vigorous retaliation. So uh, one of the worst situations is when you have two really powerful uh, sellers in an industry, they're of equal power and they're fighting against each other. Um, and because, because they're so powerful, uh, they're really hurting each other. An example of this, kind of the most striking example of this right now, is Uber and Lyft. There, it's an industry where there's basically two main sellers in that entire industry, right? And they're both incredibly powerful. They both have really big war chests um, and they're both operating at a loss right now, right? They're both uh, selling their, their service for less than it costs to provide. And the reason they're doing that is they're trying to undercut each other. They're trying to undercut each other. And so because you have these two powerful uh, businesses, these two powerful sellers that are competing against each other, it's really undermining um, industry profitability. And again, that's that's really great for the consumer, though, for the buyer, though. Like it costs like, man, sometimes I pay like four dollars to go like 10 miles on an Uber or a Lyft. Right. Um, and so it's bad for Uber and Lyft, but it's good for the buyers. And of course, Porter doesn't like that. Uh, Another bad situation for sellers is when there's a lot of different sellers of, of equally of equal power. And uh, Porter uses these terms mavericks that, oh man, how these businesses try out try and go and make money over the other businesses, right? When really they, they're mutually dependent, they should be playing nice together. Um, so an example of this is like the restaurant industry. Uh, I, I have a thing with the restaurant industry. It seems like the worst business to ever get into. I have no idea why anyone would ever want to own a restaurant. Um, but like in downtown San Rafael, you have 
dozens of restaurants that you can go to and uh, they're all competing for your business, right? And so you've got places like, um, uh, oh, Indian Chat. There's the, the place on 4th Street that gives away free meals on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And it's like, if you're a competitor, what are you supposed to do, right? Like you can't offer your product for less than free. You can't start like paying people to come, come with your product. So that'd be a maverick, right? They're ruining industry and profitability for, for everyone. Uh, okay, so this is what Porter wants. He wants a highly concentrated industry where there's only a few sellers and they're all powerful, but it's clear which one is the most powerful. And he says specifically, leaders can impose discipline as well as play a coordinative role in the industry. So again, we see that uh, labor getting together and organizing and unionizing to increase their power. That's bad. We don't want that. But when businesses come together and collaborate, coordinate, uh, it can be really good for industry profitability, which is what Porter wants. Uh, an example of this is the internet uh, service provider industry. So there's only a few players. Um, this is actually not true nationally, but I think at least locally in the Bay Area, Comcast seems to be the most powerful, uh, and then Verizon, and then kind of AT&T at the end. And they're all charging a ridiculous amount for internet service. They're not, like America has like the 37th slowest internet in the world, right? So they're not delivering value, they're not delivering quality, and they're charging exorbitant rates for it. And the reason they can do it is because they have this coordinative role. They have this uh, discipline in the industry where they're all kind of wink, wink, nod, nod. We're all gonna charge way too much for our internet service and, and not provide very high quality. Uh, when you have diverse sellers, diverse sellers are also bad because they, they don't understand, uh, they might have different strategic objectives and they don't really understand the cues from the other sellers in the industry. So you also don't want diverse sellers. You want homogenous sellers within an industry. Uh, and, and again, you can see Porter's language here agreeing on a set of rules for the game, uh, for the industry. All right, so that is Michael Porter's uh, five forces model. And essentially it's the idea that there are five major forces in an industry. Remember, we're not doing a business analysis, we're doing an industry analysis. And there are five forces within industries that influence um, how return on investment is split up amongst the key players. Uh, Economists, when they want a perfectly competitive industry, they want weak sellers, lots of sellers competing against each other, uh, more powerful suppliers that pose a uh, meaningful threat of forward integration, and then really concentrated and power, powerful buyers that can bargain for more value. Um, really easy for buyers to leave the industry and go to substitute, so there's low switching costs, and uh, low entry barriers, so new entrants can always come in, entrepreneurs can always come in and challenge existing sellers within an industry. What Porter described as sellers is wanting is this, where you have um, a few very powerful sellers, but uh, clear uh, power hierarchy amongst the sellers so that they can coordinate together. One can institute discipline in the field. Uh, you have weak, lots of suppliers that are weak, lots of buyers that are weak. There are high entry barriers, so entrepreneurs cannot come in and challenge existing sellers. Um, there's high switching costs, so buyers cannot change to substitutes. Um, and it's difficult for suppliers to forward integrate to buyers.